Well, hello there. It is good to see you again, and welcome back to another installment of Closing Arguments. I'm your host and moderator, Ryan Ruff. Boy, is it good to have you with us here on the show today. We've got Mr. John Razumich of Razumich and Associates joining us momentarily, or also known, of course, as Jack Razumich to those close with him. Jack will be jumping aboard the show with us in just a moment. But first, I want to welcome anybody onto the show, whether that's you know checking us out on a podcasting platform, maybe after the fact, or for those that are coming in right now here on the Facebook live stream, we so appreciate you joining us live on the show today. And to those people that are with us live on Facebook, Facebook. If you have a question or a comment on any of the topics that uh, you know Jack and I are going to dive into today on, uh, on the show, feel free to chime in. Leave that question or comment below. We'll carve out some time to answer those questions and comments uh, and get your you know get your urge really met there. Um, we obviously appreciate you being here with us. We want to make sure we take that time to acknowledge whatever question or comment that you do have. Uh, but all that's all the same though, to those joining us after the fact, we appreciate you being with us. Uh, look, Hey, I'm excited for today's conversation. Uh, for those of uh, you that are not new to the show and you've been with us on prior episodes, you know that this show is all about th different criminal law topics. You know, we're tapping into Jack's experiences in the courtroom, serving the greater Indianapolis area. And really, you know, we've been discussing and laying a foundation of various elements of criminal law. So, you know, you probably recall, uh, you know, prior episodes on fast and speedy trials or really what happens after a conviction. Uh, we had another episode surrounding the Miranda rights uh, and all that is entailed with them. Well, today we're really going to hone in on one specific type of law. And it's a type of law that has really been popping up in the media of late. So it's super timely for us to jump into the discu this discussion. So what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the law of self-defense. There's a lot to unpack here today, and I'm excited to get into it with Jack. So let's go ahead and bring Jack on and get today's conversation going. Jack, great to see you. How are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Hey, Ryan. Good to be back. It feels like it's been forever since we've been able to do one of these. I know. I know. This particular episode has been a long time coming. You and the team over at Razumich Associates, you guys have been super busy of late. How's everything going with you guys? Everything's going great over here. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, these episodes, as well as some of the other marketing we've been doing, have, have really helped us with our mission of reaching people who do need our help, who do need uh, our expertise with kind of protecting their freedom and protecting their future. Uh, and it's worked out great. Um, we're, as we're recording this, uh, you know and I know, uh, for the benefit of anyone who's listening afterward, this is December, uh, we have helped... Um, on this calendar year, we've helped about 127 um, individuals protect their freedom and their future over the course of this year. And the month's not even done yet. So there's still time for us to wow. protect more people moving forward. So we've definitely been very busy out here. Yeah, no, it seems like it. Well, congratulations to you and your team. Hope you guys continue to have a, a great end of the year here as we do get close to, to 2022. But uh, so that being said, you know, I, I did kind of you know, alley -oop, uh, the conversation a little bit today. We're you know, Jack, you and I are diving into the law of self-defense. Obviously, this is super pertinent, very timely topic that we're going to be getting into today. And I think a good place for us to probably start today's conversation is to have you zoom out for us and give us a bit of just a high-level overview and get into our first theme, really, of just what is self-defense generally. Uh, why don't you just start us off there? You know, what is self-defense in your eyes, Jack? Sure. And if, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, um, I'm going to do my best to give everybody sort of a general view as to the universal law of self-defense. Most of the specifics, are, of course, are going to come from my practice area in Indiana, my ability to discuss Indiana's law on these things. Um, but all 50 states do have some form of self-defense statute. Self-defense is the legal right to defend yourself, uh, defend another person, or in some cases defend certain types of property from, uh, from unlawful force. In, in the state of Indiana, for example, the specific legal definition for our self-defense statute is that uh, no person shall be held in legal jeopardy for using uh, a reasonable amount of force to defend themselves, a third person or their property from the imminent use of unlawful force against themselves. So the idea behind self-defense is that um, if you are being threatened or if a third party that is near you is being threatened or uh, if certain types of property, and that's that's going to be one of the variables between the different states is, is how property can and can't be defended with self-defense. 
Um, you do have a legal right to basically say, I was defending myself, I was defending this person, or I was defending this house or this car or uh, this business. And uh, that will be a legal defense that you are able to raise in a court of law uh, to make the decision to, to basically try to mitigate the legal jeopardy that you would be in for what would otherwise be a criminal act. Roger that. And so I think that's a great way to frame this. You know, it, it can be defending yourself, defending someone else, potentially an object or a place, really. Uh, so good high level overview there, Jack. Let's get into this idea now of of affirmative defenses. What are affirmative defenses generally? Affirmative defenses are a broad category of legal defenses that are available to a person who's been accused of breaking the law. What an affirmative defense is, it is, it is an acknowledgement that you did an action that would normally be considered illegal, but you had a legally justifiable basis for it. Um, the most uh, famous of them, of course, self-defense is an affirmative defense. It falls under that, that, that larger umbrella category of what an affirmative defense is. Um, other affirmative defenses that people have have heard in the past uh, that, I don't know, maybe we'll do episodes on these in the future. Uh, the insanity defense is another affirmative defense. Uh, entrapment's an affirmative defense and duress are affirmative defense. Uh, so, so those four, uh, entrapment, duress, uh, insanity, and self-defense, those are the most common affirmative defenses that you'll see. Out of all of those, self-defense is far and away the most common affirmative defense that you are going to see pled in any type of court. Uh, certainly in Indiana, I have to imagine in other states as well, just based off of the way those various statutes are written. Um, an affirmative defense is really interesting because, as I said, you're not denying that you did an action that would otherwise be illegal. Um, you're just saying, I totally did this, but it's okay because, you know, reasons X, Y, and Z, such as I was entrapped by the police or, you know, I was engaging in self-defense. Um, you know, those are the types of things that, that, uh, that you do see with an affirmative defense. That's, that's kind of what that is just on a, on a quick nutshell view. Okay. Gotcha. Appreciate that. And, and I do see here, uh, you know, we have John, uh, uh or excuse me, Joshua Rotella that's joining us on the Facebook live, Joshua, we appreciate you. Thanks for being with us. If you do have a, a question or comment on today's discussion, feel free to leave that below for us. We'll carve out some time for that, but, uh, no good high level overview there on, on uh, making those affirmative defenses. So my next question then would be really, let's get into the nuts and bolts of it here, John, you know, how does one make a claim for self-defense and, and when can you claim for self-defense? I guess that's a little bit of a two-part question, but how would you answer that? This is, again, it's going to be one of those things that that's going to vary between jurisdictions. That's going to vary between how uh, individual courts determine those things. Affirmative defenses, different jurisdictions will have different procedural rules that say when you do and don't need to actually raise those. Uh, with self-defense being an affirmative defense, a lot of times... Uh, state procedural rules will require you to notify the prosecution in advance, hey, I intend to pursue a defense of self-defense. Um, if you are, Indiana does not, actually. Uh, Indiana is one of the states we have a very few cate narrow category of affirmative defenses that, uh, that we are required to plead by statute. Self-defense is not on that. You can bring self-defense up uh, as early as in the middle of the trial if you have to. It's usually a bad idea um, because judges get a little bit unhappy if they get, you know, if they think the trial is going to go one way and then all of a sudden they have, um, you know, this completely new set of instructions they need to draft that are coming out of them from, from left field. Um, but generally speaking, if you want to go through the formalities of notifying your the state and the court that you're going to be proceeding with self-defense, uh, the way that we've done it in our office is we just file a... Uh, it's a simple two-page pleading. It would be uh, defendant's notice of affirmative defenses, and we would just put in there specifically, um, you know, comes now the defendant, John Smith, uh, by counsel, et cetera, et cetera, and would advise the court that he intends to pursue the affirmative defense of self-defense in this case. Um, it, it's important to also note, it, it, it should probably be obvious um, but self-defense cases are going to be constrained to battery and battery style offenses. Um, you're not going to be able to make a claim for self-defense or something like shoplifting. That, that doesn't make any sense. You're not protecting yourself 
from the use of force against you because you really wanted that Marie Corps bag. Um, <laughs> Self-defense is very much limited to interactions between live people. Um, you know, you'll see it in domestic cases where uh, one party is, is arrested and charged with a domestic battery offense and says, hey, um, you know, yes, I scratched my husband or yes, I shoved my wife away from me and she fell down, but I was defending myself because they were attacking me first. Or um, if you're in a um, bar fight situation, which is sadly where a lot of our self-defense cases come from, are, are people who have had one too many and uh, pushing and shoving starts happening. Um, that's where you're going to claim a self-defense issue. And you can even claim, at least in Indiana, at least in Indiana, you legally can claim self-defense against the actions of the police as well. If the police are using what would objectively be considered to be an excessive amount of force, you can claim self-defense against them. Now, that's that's a very, very uphill battle, to be perfectly honest. I've only seen a mm -hmm. couple of those cases that have worked. Yeah. I have not worked on any of them, uh, but it is okay. legally permissible. It is, it is in the statute that you are allowed to use the self-defense affirmative defense against law enforcement officers in the state of Indiana yeah. if they are engaging in conduct that would otherwise be considered excessive or otherwise illegal. Got it. Got it. Okay. So Jack, I've, I've heard of these two things. It's uh, the castle doctrine and then stand your ground. Where do these two things come into play? How is self-defense maybe different or the same as those two? Talk to us a little bit about this. It's, it's a little bit, again, it goes back to the concept of if affirmative defenses are an umbrella term that covers things like self-defense, castle doctrine and stand your ground are going to be under the umbrella of self-defense generally. Uh, both Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground are subsets of self-defense that discuss when a defendant might need to retreat. So if you have what's referred to as a stand your ground type of statute, uh, that means that you are not under an obligation to try to flee before claiming self-defense. So um, in a stand your ground type of a situation, if you are fearful for your safety before you can claim self-defense, you would have to try to escape that situation. You have to try to leave the situation. Um, you would have to try to avoid the situation that leads you claiming self-defense. Uh, Castle Doctrine is a similar idea. Castle Doctrine is the idea that if you are in your own home, um, mm -hmm. you have no duty to retreat. So the idea is like if a burglar breaks into your house, you do not have to worry about trying to escape from your own home if you are going to be in a position where you have to defend yourself against that burglar. Uh, whereas if you were out on the street and a mugger tried to to rob you, you might have to uh, you might have to flee. And and not all states have every aspect of that. So, for example, as I said, all fifty states do have a self defense statute. Um, not all 50 states have self-defense statutes that are the exact same way. Um, stand Your Ground really became a big thing in Florida in the uh, early 2010s uh, with the George Zimmerman case, which if we have time, we'll discuss how that you know re relates to self-defense later. Um, Florida was the first state that I am aware of that specifically wrote into their statute that there is no duty to retreat. That's what your Stand Your Ground means. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of other states follow that afterwards. I believe in Indiana as recently as 2013 when they updated uh, their statute, I believe that we put in uh, that Indiana, you no longer have a duty to retreat. Um, Indiana has always had, as far as I can recall, certainly during my practice area um, or practice time, we have always had a castle doctrine where you do not have to retreat from your own home. Um, but until recently, Indiana, you would have to try to avoid the situation before you would claim self-defense. Uh, Texas, likewise, is another example. They had a castle doctrine for a long time, but only recently had to stand your ground. So that's mm -hmm. that's kind of what those are. It's 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 the different subsets of of aspects of self defense on that. Makes sense. So essentially, you know, really like a, an encapsulation of our our first theme here on the show. What is self defense generally? Well, we understand what it is, and also just the fact that 
all states have different self-defense laws. It's not a one size fit all when it comes to this idea of self-defense and, and when going through the court system, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment, uh, you know, it will vary from state to state. So that being said, uh, for those that are jumping in live with us here on the Facebook live stream, just a real quick refresher. I'm Ryan Ruff, host and moderator. We've got John Razumich of Razumich Associates uh, with us today talking about uh, what is self-defense. And we just covered the idea, you know, that high arching overview of what is self-defense. But now let's get into the nitty gritty of this. Let's talk self-defense in trial, John. So first and foremost, how about we have you start then by, you know, what happens when maybe you make a claim of self-defense and how do we start getting into the actual trial part of this conversation? Sure. Um, there's a little bit of gamesmanship anytime that you're making a, a self-defense claim or, or any affirmative defense claim generally, because again, mm -hmm. remember when you make that affirmative defense claim, you are saying, I absolutely did what I am charged with, but I have a legally justifiable reason for doing it. That's why sometimes it is tactically advantageous to, um, to kind of keep that affirmative defense in your back pocket until the last second. You know, as I said, you can risk pissing off a judge, uh, which is never a good plan, but sometimes right. it's in your client's best interest. Uh, there are three primary ways that you would defend yourself against a battery type of claim. The first is to argue the battery never happened. That's going to be your actual innocence claim. The second is to argue that the battery happened, but some unknown third party who wasn't you was responsible for the injury. And uh, the third way is to argue that you committed the battery, but you had the legally justifiable reason, which was the self-defense. If you go straight to arguing self-defense at the trial level, especially if you've notified the prosecution of that in advance, what you have done is you created a situation where the prosecutor no longer needs to try to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you actually committed the battery offense that you're on trial for. You've effectively conceded that point by saying, I absolutely am responsible for this battery. I'm just not guilty of it because of this reason. So hmm. that's kind of the first thing that happens is when you're making a claim of self-defense, you're effectively cutting half of the state's job out of it um, because you're under no obligation to actually pursue an affirmative defense. Um, as I said, there, there is a requirement in certain jurisdictions that you do have to notify the court and the prosecutor in advance. But just because you're notifying them of this doesn't mean that you have to go through it. It would be along the lines of basically saying, uh, you know, to one of your friends, hey, you know, um, I think I might go to the movies on Friday you know, you've announced that, hey, I, this is something I might do, but you're under no obligation to go to the movies on Friday. Same situation. If you say in advance, I'm going to pursue a self-defense claim, um, and then you decide to abandon it for whatever reason, you know, they can't basically say, hey, well, you told us you were going to go do a self-defense claim. We prepared our case based off of self-defense, and now you're not pursuing self-defense. Um, now, trust me, the prosecutor is never going to to take that position from their perspective. If you've notified them in advance, hey, we're pursuing self-defense, uh, they're going to think that you have made their job easier. They're going to look at it from the perspective of, cool, now I don't have to worry about proving that uh, this defendant is the one who did the attack or that this victim is the one that was attacked by the defendant because they're conceding that up front by making that self-defense argument. So that's kind of the first thing that happens is you just basically mm – -hmm say, yep, totally did it. Now we're going to start talking about the nitty gritty details. Got it. Okay. So now let's talk about this idea of burden. How does the burden shifting of, of proving self-defense, where, where does this come into play? How does this all work, Jack? This is again, one of those things that is going to be very, very jurisdiction specific because mm -hmm. an affirmative defense by its operation acknowledges that I committed this offense that would otherwise be a crime, um, different burdens factor into it. The, the traditional burden, of course, if you were accused of breaking the law, is that the state is responsible for proving you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So what happens in an affirmative defense where you walk in there and say, I am responsible for this injury, I am responsible for this action. Well, now the state's not going to be held to that same burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt because that's too easy. That's, that's shooting fish in a barrel. If you walk in and say, I hit right. this guy, you know, now they don't have to prove it. That's what we were talking about a moment ago. So what happens in Indiana 
is the burden shifts as far as what the prosecution is required to prove. Because the prosecution is no longer required to prove beyond reasonable doubt that you were responsible for this battery offense, in Indiana, what the prosecutor becomes responsible for proving beyond a reasonable doubt is that this individual defendant used more force than was reasonably necessary to repel the imminent unlawful use of force on themselves. That is the very specific legal language for it to try to break that down into something that makes sense to people. What the state has to prove is the state has to prove that the force the defendant was using was disproportionate or excessive compared to the force that was about to be used against them. The example that I would use is if somebody is outside of your house screaming about how they hate you and they wish you were dead and if they had a pack of matches, they would set fire to your house right now. They're very clearly being aggressive towards you. They're very clearly forcibly threatening you. You cannot, however, take an assault rifle and just shoot them. Because that's that's an excessive amount of force at that point in time. So if that mm-hmm. situation were to pop up, you know, if, if you made the self defense claim in that situation, you are claiming, hey, um, you know, yes, I absolutely shot this guy who is threatening me on my doorstep. Um, right. You know, the state it would be in the position of saying, okay, well, you know, now what we have to prove is. Um, we have to prove that your shooting that defendant, th- that victim, was excessive based off of the threat that he posed to your physical safety. Um, and as I said, that's a very Indiana specific definition of it. Other states may have different ways that they handle that. Um, I, I, to my, to my limited experience, certainly here in the Central Midwest. That seems to be consistent, is that if you are going to make a claim for self-defense, um, the state's burden becomes, okay, now we have to prove beyond reasonable death that this individual defendant used an excessive amount of force mm. rather than the just right amount of force. The the thing that will... Yeah, that's thing, interesting. Yeah, yeah the thing, that, the, the way that we joke about it sometimes is we call it almost like the Goldilocks defense because... <laughs> sure. You know, if, if you use too little force you know you're probably going to be killed or seriously hurt if you use too much force you're probably going to prison so you kind of need to use the baby bear just right amount of force on that (laughs) to prevent yourself from being convicted man well hey that's really beneficial information to know so thank you for sharing that with us Uh, my mind then jumps to okay we're in the courtroom uh you know is there a situation where somebody has to get up there and testify for their own defense when going through a self-defense claim? My immediate response is to say yes. Uh, there, mm-hmm. there are very few instances where it is, in my opinion, essential for a defendant to take the stand in their own behalf. Self-defense is one of them. And the reason for that is self-defense is, is such a personal claim that you really do need to be able to establish how and why you were in fear. Um, to dip back into the the crazy legal world of, of what the attorneys argue about, um, to prevail on a claim of self-defense, what the defendant needs to show the jury is that their subjective belief that they were in danger or another person was in danger was objectively reasonable based off of all the factors that led up to that claim of self-defense. Uh, and, and because that is a subjective belief, you have to be able to communicate that I was scared, this is why I was scared, and this is why I took the actions that I did. Those are things that are very difficult to establish from anyone other than the defendant themselves. Mm-hmm. It is technically possible to establish a claim for self-defense without testifying. It's very difficult though to to establish that type of a situation with regards to um, establishing that claim for self-defense without testifying, you would need to have a number of disinterested witnesses 
who would be able to testify to a, a pattern of abuse over the course of the night. So, for example, uh, going back to the bar fight style situation, yeah. if you have a defendant who has spent the entire night being followed around by a larger uh, man who's, uh, you know, insulting them or slapping them or shoving them around or uh, very audibly and very loudly threatens their life. And, you know, along the lines of, you know, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. And when you walk out of here, I'm going to shoot you dead. That can establish self-defense without needing to testify because you have enough other witnesses mm -hmm. who can say, yeah, you know, he was constantly being pushed yeah. around. He's being shoved, being slapped. He was being threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, and in those circumstances, you can't establish it. But those are, again, very few and far between. And, and to be perfectly honest, as much issue as I have with the prosecution sometimes in the way that they examine these things and the way they do um, make their charging decisions for a situation like that, mm -hmm. where you have a large number of people who are going to sit there and say, no, nah, he was totally acting in defense. That case probably isn't actually making it to trial uh, because yeah, it, it may point. not even get charged in the first place. So the, sure. yeah, you know, again, I generally speaking, yes, you probably would need to testify in your own defense on a self-defense claim. Mm -hmm. Okay, good to know. And what in we've been walking through the different types of self defenses, how how somebody would go about making that claim. Let's talk about the limitations now on making a self defense claim. Are there limitations? Talk to us about this and and how they come into the play here. There are absolutely limitations on self defense. Um, everything in the law has limits. Anyone who claims that the sure. law is is unlimited in one direction or another. Uh, knows nothing about the law. So there are <laughs> limits on what you can claim for self-defense. The first is, um, like I mentioned er earlier, your response has to be proportional. So you are not allowed to go straight to the nuclear option if you're claiming self-defense. Um, and, and that's a very fine line. You know, for example, if someone is just punching you and kicking you and you take a gun out and you shoot them, they will probably arrest you and charge you. Does that mean that they are going to be able to get a conviction? Absolutely not, because there could be other factors that that play into that, such as, okay, you know, is the person who's being punched and kicked, um, you know, are they a teenager being, you know, punched and kicked by an MMA fighter? You know, that's the type mm -hmm. of thing that they would look at for that. It's like that's that type of proportion. But if you've got two normal adults, for lack of a better way of describing it, I would hope that by the time people get to be an adult, they they stop engaging in, in street fights like this. But if you have two normal adults who are evenly matched physically, you know, not, you know neither of them has a disability, neither of them uh, has a weapon at the beginning of the fight, um, you know, a straight on slobber knocker fist fight you're not going to be able to claim self-defense if during that you um grab a gun and decide you're going to shoot this person because you're tired of getting mm -hmm. punched uh, another limitation on self-defense is you have to have what's referred to as clean hands you cannot claim self-defense if you are actively breaking the law and and even that has some complications to it so for example in uh, in lake county uh, which for the benefit of people who aren't in Indiana listening to this, Lake County is uh, one of the north uh, northwestern most counties in Indiana. It's right up on Lake Michigan, hence the name. Um, there is a case up there. Uh, I don't know that it's through the Court of Appeals yet, but it involved a self-defense claim from uh, a guy who was admittedly, he was there as a drug dealer. Uh, he, was, he was absolutely there as a drug dealer. There's no getting around that. Um, mm -hmm. So he's breaking the law by making a drug sale, but the person that he was trying to sell drugs to then attacked him for the purposes of robbing him of his drugs and his money. And uh, the drug dealer slash defendant uh, grabbed a gun, which also technically he should not have had, and mm -hmm. uh, shot the person who was robbing him. And the defense argued self-defense and the state argued, well, you can't claim self-defense. You're actively breaking the law right now, so you don't get that. Um, and, mm, and I think that's still in the Court of Appeals right now. Uh, so that that could have a decision by the time all this is done that could be different. Uh, but that's one of the that's one of the other limitations. Like you have to have clean hands. You can't actively uh -huh. be breaking the law. Um, another limitation is you can't instigate the fight. You know, you can't walk <laughs> sure. up to somebody, slap them in the face, 
and you know call their mother a nasty name and then you know if you if you start getting beaten down use it as justification for for claiming self defense, for self -defense. Sure. Um, now now again obviously slapping them is a crime that that is its own separate battery offense and that goes back to the issue of you cannot um you know you can't be breaking the law um but provocation mm -hmm. provoking someone into attacking you for the purposes of defending yourself or for defending yourself um mm. that's considered that's considered a limitation you you can't actively sure. go looking for a fight is is, is mm -hmm. what you're looking at with that good to know yeah these are some some uh I don't want to say loopholes that needed to be addressed <laughs> via limitations, but no, no, it's certainly interesting to know given, uh, and the, I, I really appreciate you sharing the, the clean hands idea with us as well, because uh, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting how a self-defense claim can be made uh, in the midst of a crime happening, but uh, boy, is that interesting for, to have you share that with us. So thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, let's wrap up our second theme, really talking about self-defense in trial here, Jack. Uh, let's talk about the jury standpoint here mm -hmm. uh, during that question case what are they looking at when determining uh a self-defense claim like what's what's the jury looking for throughout this process like i said what the jury and and it's complicated and i'm sure uh, you know defense attorneys and prosecutors will try to break it down as easily as we can for them but like i said what the jury has to determine is the jury has to determine whether or not it has been proven beyond reasonable doubt that this defendant who's claiming self-defense um, was subjectively in fear of his safety, that his actions were objectively okay. And mm -hmm. what they'll look at for that is they'll look for a lot of just kind of the circumstantial incidents that surround it. Um, you know, as I said, if you've got an MMA fighter who's beating up a teenager, you know, very clearly, whatever that teenager is claiming self-defense, he's going to get a little bit more of a benefit of the doubt on that one, because I don't know very many teenagers can go toe to toe with Brock Lesnar. <laughs> sure. uh, so from that perspective, that's one of the things they look at. It's like, you know, okay, are the physical, are the physical differences there? Uh, another thing that they'll look at is, has there been a history or a pattern of violent acts from the alleged victim towards the defendant or towards someone that it, that the defendant is in immediate contact with. Um, we had one self-defense case that we did, I want to say about five years ago, uh, as of the recording of this video, that involved um, a, a, a uh, decedent. And unfortunately, this, this particular self-defense case um, the, the alleged victim, uh, passed away as a result of, of being shot by my client. Um, uh, but there was a long history of that particular defendant, not that particular, defendant, excuse me, that particular victim, uh, attacking not only my client, but, um, my client's sister, who is, who is the wife of the decedent. So, uh, that knowledge of this is a violent person who is prone to attacking people, that's another thing the jury would look at to determine whether or not an individual defendant has a reasonable belief for the fear of their safety. Um, th those are kind of the two biggest things that juries look at to, to determine whether or not this is a reasonable claim or not. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, I guess a very near third one would again be the situation the state's looking at is like, is the response proportional? You know, if someone is threatening you with a stick, yeah. you know, did you, shoot them with a shotgun. It's like, you know, that's, right. that's probably a little Retaliate bit proportional that at that point in time. So mm -hmm. that's, that's largely what they're looking at. Sure. That seems to be kind of like the golden rule, if you will, throughout right. this, this, you know, it's at the core of a lot of these self-defense claims is that idea of our, you know, is are are the defensive actions proportionate to what was, what was oncoming essentially. Correct. So I think it's safe to say then, you know, my final question for you to wrap up this theme here, Jack was, was, does self-defense always work? And I think we've arrived at the fact, no, it doesn't because of limitations that exist yep. because from state to state that, you know, there are differences in the law, but uh, give me your answer in this idea of does self-defense always work? I think we know, it, but talk yeah. to me about this. It, it absolutely does not. Um, mm. I have handled, let me rephrase that. I think, I think self-defense works a little bit more consistently when people don't pass away as a result of the incident. Um, I, I have handled in my career 
Um, I've handled three self-defense cases where the victim, um, which, and they, you know, my clients were convicted, so they are legally victims at that point in time. Uh, the victims of my client's actions, unfortunately, did not survive. Um, and, and I have to think that a part of that is, again, if you have someone who has passed away, there is a much more critical, did you do everything you could to get away? Even though, even though the law doesn't require that, it's one of those things that there's a much higher percentage of like, look, you killed somebody. Could you have gotten out of this otherwise? Um, I've done a number of self-defense cases at the lower level felony level and the misdemeanor level um, where that has been a very successful defense based off of, again, the factors that we're looking at. Um, honestly, the, this, the second jury trial that I ever did way back in uh, 2000, 2007, that was the second jury trial that I did. The second jury trial I, I ever did, it was a, it was a misdemeanor a domestic battery case and our defense was self-defense and that won, you, you know, so that mm, worked. Okay. Um, so to, to the, the limitations of my experience, I would say that the self-defense cases that I've worked on that involved homicides, unfortunately have not been as successful. Uh, the mm -hmm. self-defenses I've worked on that did not involve uh, people passing away. Those seem to be a little bit more successful. That's not, it's not a hard rule. It, it, it just really is yeah. illustrates that again, it's not always going to work no matter what you try to sure. put for, no matter what type of arguments you try to put in, the jury's going to do what the jury's going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the end of the day, the, you know, Hey, when you're in the courtroom, it, it ultimately ends with them. So you get, you know, your case has got to be good. So Jack, as we shift to our third and final theme in the conversation today, just a real quick uh, reminder for those that are joining us here live on the Facebook live stream. I'm Ryan Ruff. He's Jack Razumich. We're here talking criminal law today. We're diving into the law of self-defense. Our third and final theme for this conversation, Jack, media and their role within self-defense cases. Let's dive into some of the, the bigger self-defense cases that we've seen popping up of late. I think it almost goes without being mentioned is the Kyle Rittenhouse case. One very pertinent these days popping up near the top of every, any, you know, news outlet. Talk to me about this case where self-defense falls within it. Uh, you, you know, I want to get your take on this matter. The Rittenhouse case has done more for self-defense, both good and ill, than any other major case that I can think of in, in two to three decades. Um, the the Rittenhouse case, I, 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 I have to imagine, granted we're recording this contemporaneously in, in December of 2021, if, if anyone's still listening to this in 10, 15 years time, uh, you know, greetings from the past. Um, <laughs> the, the Rittenhouse case was premised on the idea that Kyle Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense when he shot, um, Joseph Rosenbaum, uh, Gage, uh, Grosskreutz, who was the, the gentleman that survived. And, um, I know his last name is Huber and I, I apologize. I cannot remember what the third gentleman's name was, the, the second gentleman who passed away. Um, the idea was that Rittenhouse was the, the argument of the defense was that Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense um, when he fired those shots. And the way that they built that defense was to establish that with regards to uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, what happened is that Kyle was actively Kyle Rittenhouse was actively trying to retreat from a, a hot zone style area. There, there had been an altercation with, uh, with Mr. Rosenbaum earlier in the evening. Uh, there were witnesses that were put on to testify that uh, Rosenbaum had threatened Rittenhouse, uh, threatened that, you know, if I get you alone, uh, I'm going to cut your heart out. That was one of the pieces of testimony that came out. Uh, Rittenhouse did, as we all know at this point in time, testify in his own defense. And part of his testimony was that, you know, Rosenbaum reached for my rifle and based off his earlier threats, based off the fact that, you know, he's actively and aggressively chasing a man with a rifle, uh, Rittenhouse was afraid that if the rifle was taken from him, uh, Rosenbaum would use it to shoot and, and murder Rittenhouse. So that's when he fired. So that was the claim of self-defense against uh, against Joseph Rosenbaum. 
Uh, with regards to the other two incidents, the argument was that, and, and this is this is more than anything, the, the serious problem that we have with mob justice or vigilante style justice, what the crowd knew at this point in time is that there is an active shooter. Kyle Rittenhouse represents an active shooter. And as a result, they began chasing Rittenhouse because from their perspective, they don't know what's happened. All they know is that Rittenhouse has shot somebody. So they're chasing him down. They get him surrounded. And uh, Anthony Huber, Anthony Huber, that was his first name, was Anthony. Mr. Huber, uh, at that point in time, uh, attempts to disarm Rittenhouse with a, with a, it was a skateboard that he had with him, um, I believe. And, and I apologize if I have this wrong. I believe that Mr. Huber uh, struck Rittenhouse twice with the skateboard. Uh, and at that point in time, that is when uh, Rittenhouse shot Huber, uh, which killed him. And that's again, goes back to the concept of this is where self-defense becomes a little bit complicated. At that immediate moment in time, what we have is you have Rittenhouse, who is fearful for his safety. He has just been, you know, he's just been involved in a shooting incident. Um, he's being chased by a large crowd who uh, probably does not have his best interest in mind, and he's being attacked by another individual. Under those circumstances, the issue becomes one of, is shooting was shooting Huber a proportionate use of force? And um, I don't know the last time you actually looked at a skateboard, but a professional skateboard, those are large, heavy implements. Um, they're, they're large, thick wooden boards that have heavy metal wheels and casings on both sides of them. You can absolutely kill someone with one of those. It is a bludgeoning weapon. So under those circumstances, um, Rittenhouse had what his defense attorneys argue was a reasonable expectation of safety and shot Huber. Um, and that brought Gage Grosskreutz into it. And what Mr. Grosskreutz did is, again, he is aware that there have been, an there have been allegations of an active shooter. Um, he follows along with the mob. He sees Rittenhouse shoot Huber. And at that point in time, um, Grosskreutz had his own firearm. And you've got almost a little bit of like an Old West stare down, draw down. And um, Grosskreutz testified in, in, his, in his testimony that he pointed the gun at Rittenhouse and Rittenhouse shot at him. And that's, that's when he got hit in the arm. Where this is is such a fascinating, and, and again, it, it's it's tragic across the board. It's tragic for everybody that's involved in this. Sure. Um, where it's remarkably interesting, though, is if Anthony Huber had killed Kyle Rittenhouse, or if Gage Grosskreutz, who had a gun when he approached Rittenhouse, if he had shot and killed Rittenhouse, my professional opinion is that either of those two individuals also would have had a valid self-defense claim. Because from their perspective, again, self-defense is a personal subjective belief. It, it's based off of what do you personally believe to be, you know, is, is your personal subjective belief that you are in danger, is that, a, is that objectively reasonable based off the totality of the circumstances? In the case of Anthony Huber, again, Anthony Huber is aware that we have an active shooter this person has a gun. They're saying that that guy is the shooter. Um, he's acting at that point in time, potentially in defense of others, which again, um, <laughs> thanks, Josh. I, uh, for, for those of you who are on the live stream, Josh Rotella has been commenting. Josh and I went to high school together, so he's, uh, he's being a supportive friend. So I really appreciate that, Josh. Um, the, um, the, you know, Anthony Huber at that point in time, he's, he's acting in defense of others. Um, because from his perspective, we have an active shooter situation going on. With Gage Grosskreutz, his potential self-defense argument is even stronger because not only has he been made aware that there's an active shooter situation going on, he has just watched Rittenhouse shoot another person. That is absolutely going to get to the point of this is a proportionate response of, and, and use of force from Grosskreutz mm -hmm. if he had shot and killed Rittenhouse. And that's that's yeah. one of the things that the media, I, I, it's not really fair to say the media, it's certainly the, the, the I don't want to say partisans because we're trying to be as neutral on this as we can, but the, the tribes mm -hmm. have kind of really staked out the two most extreme polarizations on that because 
Um, you know, you've got some people who just refuse to acknowledge that that Rittenhouse was in any way, shape or form blameless. And you've got other people who are, you know, refusing to acknowledge that Rosenbaum, Huber, or Groschkreutz was were in any way uh, responsible or, or not blameless. But again, that script could have easily been flipped and it could have easily mm-hmm. have been Groschkreutz on trial or Huber on trial. And based off of my understanding of the Wisconsin statute, which again, as we've mentioned many times, I'm not a Wisconsin attorney. My knowledge is just out of Indiana. But if that case had happened in Indiana, it absolutely would have been a situation that in my professional opinion, either Anthony Huber or uh, Gage Groschkorts could have claimed self-defense if they had killed or seriously injured Kyle Rittenhouse. That's why self-defense law is so very, very fact-specific. Yeah. Yeah. And and Jack, I'm so glad that you had mentioned uh, this specific trial, you know, when we were getting ready to plan for this discussion and this show today, because A, is it ever so timely? And B, boy, does it define and show the fine line that is a self-defense claim. You could, you could see it on both ends of, of this particular case. So I'm glad, we, you know, you were able to utilize this, you know, we could utilize this one to further emphasize this idea of of what is self-defense, truly the, the embodiment of this episode. And we've got a few other, you know, pertinent court cases listed here in front of us, Jack. And, and uh, I'll let you pick from the, that list, you know, that's in front of us as to maybe some other examples. You know, we are coming in here probably close to the end of our time today, but are there any other pertinent court cases that pop into mind that uh, are self-defense specific that you think would be good for our conversation today to bring up? Yeah, I'll try to, I'll, I'll try to lighting around this one as, as Ryan pointed sure, out. Sure, sure. Listeners, we, uh, we, we do try to plan these things out. It's not completely free form. So, uh, we do have, <laughs> we have timelines and things we, but, uh, yeah. and I like to talk. So, uh, imagine that a lawyer likes to talk. <laughs> you got um, really in. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> With regards to, uh, one of the earlier things that we talked about before the concept of the mm-hmm. stand your ground law, um, that exploded onto the political scene and the legal scene in response to the uh, Trayvon Martin situation with George Zimmerman down in Florida in, I believe, 2010 or 2011. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Florida was the first state to codify that um, that you did not have to retreat to claim self-defense. So the media picked up and ran with that story and they ran with the assumption that it was a stand your ground situation. It absolutely was not. Um, the, the Trayvon Martin case, the George Zimmerman Trayvon Martin case was a traditional self-defense argument. The, the argument was that uh, Zimmerman who was uh, working, working is a flexible term, but uh, you know, doing whatever, type of patrol um, he was doing as a member of, of his neighborhood watch. Um, that was a, you know, he approached Trayvon Martin, asked Martin what he was doing, um, which, you know, again, legally he doesn't have uh, authority to do. You know, again, Zimmerman has no authority to actually stop people. Um, Martin took offense to this and Martin um, engaged in what was ultimately found at the jury to be an aggressive act of battery against Zimmerman at that point in time, even though Zimmerman did not have the authority to initially detain Martin, uh, he was not initially aggressive in a physical concept. So Martin's actions, uh, escalated it that led to the ability to claim self-defense at that point in time. So it goes back to the issue of you have to have clean hands, um, and, and the concept of provocation, um, even if it was provocation for, for Zimmerman to stop Martin, the issue is Martin's response at that point in time is um, excessive and then flips the script on whether or not Zimmerman can claim self-defense. Two other famous cases out of Florida that came up in relatively quick succession, also dealing with the standard ground law, uh, were the case of Michael Dunn, who in 2012 shot and killed a 17 year old man by the name of Jordan Davis at a gas station who argued that Davis was threatening him by having his music too loud. Um, It goes without saying that loud music is not intimidating enough to claim that you have to defend yourself against it, especially at a gas station where you can get in your car and leave right away. He wanted to argue stand your ground because, well, I don't have to retreat. That's again, not how stand your ground applies because you know, you're not, you know, this, the action of loud music is not going to be aggressive. So he was, he was convicted in that case. 
and is currently serving a life sentence. And then uh, Marissa Alexander was another Florida case that tried to claim stand your ground. Now, her case was a little bit more interesting as far as the facts were concerned. Um, Marissa Alexander went to her estranged husband's house. They got into an argument um, and she left like she she left. She disengaged from the argument, went to her car, got a gun out of it and then came back and argued, um, you know, fired, fired what she referred to as a warning shot at her husband and claimed that she was acting in self-defense. And that was not a successful argument because from the jury's perspective, okay, so you left, got a weapon, and then came back to continue the argument. You're not acting in any type of self-defense. And because stand your ground is a subset of self-defense, if you're not acting in self-defense, that is, uh, that's something that you're, you're not going to be able to proceed with. Um, I'm going to answer Josh's question. Um, Josh has brought up Bernie Getz. Uh, Bernie Getz, for those of you who, uh, who aren't uh, true crime aficionados or, or other individuals, uh, Bernie Getz was notorious for um, basically creating a target of himself. He would, he, he was the victim of, of repeated muggings in New York in the 1970s, and he made the determination that what I'm going to do is I'm going to just wait for someone to come up and mug me, and uh, then I'm going to take him out because that's I'll be acting in self-defense if they attack me first. Mm, interesting. Um, the problem that that had is that, again, shows premeditation and provocation. Self-defense mm -hmm. as a whole is is sort of a spontaneous thing. You can't plan for self-defense is kind of the way that played out. Um, mm -hmm. These days, that would be considered to be a I, – depending on what jurisdiction you're in, that could potentially be considered to be a premeditated murder or at least a premeditated mm -hmm. manslaughter. Um, because okay. – Interestingly enough, you know, Bernie Gates does get his self-defense claim on it. So, you know, it is not a situation that he went there. You, you can make an argument, and, and, the, and the district attorney's office certainly made the argument that he was lying in wait to ambush and execute somebody. But those people didn't have to actually attack him first. So it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. one of those, like, again, no one's got clean hands on this. The issue just becomes one of... If you're going in there to intentionally put yourself in a situation where you're going to defend yourself, um, you know, has that has that gotten over the line? And it goes back to the issue of the provocation we talked about earlier, yeah. um, which just bring you back full circle to Rittenhouse. That was one of the state's arguments was that he went there intentionally to provoke a response. And if that were true, Rittenhouse would not be able to claim self-defense at that point in time because everything that happened cascaded out of his actions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that at this point in time, if, if Bernie was riding the subway right now and, and making a target of himself like that, I suspect that his case would not go as well as it did in the seventies. Um, sure. but in the seventies, there were, there were enough gray areas in the law that he was able to kind of get through that without too much difficulty. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, that is, that, that is one of those areas of self-defense law where that would fall under the category of maybe not clean hands. Uh, mm -hmm. Because you have intentionally created a situation that um, that you know you're you're not an innocent actor on your own. You're an active participant at that point in time in the result that you're trying to create. Yeah, it sounds like it was clean hands met with a little dash of of provocation as well in that regard. Right. You know, so exactly. it's kind of a, a two cents there. But um, no, well, thank you to Josh for for chiming in with Bernie. Uh, that was a good little example for us to to pepper in there here at the end. But um, Jack, we've we've touched on a lot today. You know, to recap kind of our discussion for our audience here, we talked about what is self-defense generally. We had a nice discussion there to bat lead off really on our show today. Then, of course, self-defense within trial, how, you know, a jury needs to look at self-defense claims, the, you know, the testimonies that come into play, whether somebody needs to testify on their own behalf in a self-defense claim. A lot of different good discussion there. And then, of course, uh, the Rittenhouse case, um, you know, as well as Zimmerman, you know, a lot of good discussions in regards to self-defense. And as you just mentioned uh, with Josh's suggestion in Bernie's case, well, we see that there, there are gray areas in the law in the past, and this seems to be a bit of a recurring theme in a lot of our episodes, Jack, and that's, you know, the law gets defined and sharpened and fine-tuned over time so that those gray areas tend to 
more or less go away. And we're going to see that obviously in more discussions about specific laws in sure. episodes to come. But, uh, but Hey, as we bring our conversation to a head, Jack, any final thoughts, anything in closing that you would like to leave, uh, you know, leave our audience with. And then of course, you know, for anybody that has stuck around today for, you know, the show, we would obviously want to let them know how they could reach out to you and your team should the need uh, to continue this conversation ever happen. Again, as I mentioned, self-defense is going to be a very fact sensitive situation. There's not really a one size fits all definition of self-defense or, or, or defense of self-defense. Um, the best thing that you can do is if you've been accused of a battery offense, give our office a call. As always, our office telephone number is 317-983-5333. We do handle cases all over the state of Indiana. Battery cases, to the extent that I am capable of saying that we specialize in anything, battery cases are something that we handle a lot more than other things. There are attorneys who spend a lot of the time on DUIs or drug offenses. We spend a lot of time on battery cases. So mm -hmm. um, the ups and downs of what we need to look at with regards to what witnesses we need to find, what types of defenses we need to build, we're kind of your one-stop battery shop, as weird as that sounds. I need to work on those slogans a little bit better. That's the free form portion of doing this live. There you uh, go. <laughs> but yeah, generally speaking, much, much like with, and not just with battery cases, as, as I say all the time, uh, contacting your office for a case evaluation is always free. It's always going to be free. The only investment you're making is about 40 minutes of your time to speak with one of our qualified attorneys about your case and determining what your best defenses are going to be. Uh, so that number again, 317-983-5333. Fantastic. Well, Jack, we appreciate you and your time, you know, jumping aboard today to talk the law of self-defense with us. I think the conversation was super beneficial for anybody that had joined us uh, for its duration. And hey, I'm looking forward to, to jumping back on board with you down the road for another live stream. And of course, another episode uh, surrounding, of course, yet another, uh, you know, criminal law related topic. Sounds like a plan. Alrighty. Thanks, Jack. And look, hey, we want to take one final moment, of course, to thank you, our audience, for joining us with, you know, on the episode today. Of course, whether that was on the podcasting platform after the fact, or if you were with us on the Facebook live stream, all the same. We appreciate you and your presence today. Uh, you know, again, as we've said it before, we'll say it a thousand times. If you like the content, you like these types of conversations between Jack and myself, please do us a favor and like the show, comment, subscribe to it on whichever platform you are checking us out on. And then, of course, share these types of conversations with friends, families, because at the end of the day, these conversations are meant for you. You know, we want to tap in to John's experiences in criminal law, bring some great conversations to your doorstep and, and allow, you know, an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Like, you know, we had Josh Rotella ask us a handful of questions today. So we would hate to have you miss out on any of those great conversations down the road. And we'd love to have you be a part of them. So for Mr. John Razimich, I'm Ryan Ruff. We're saying so long and we thank you so much once more for joining us on today's edition of Closing Arguments. <laughs>